people. Yep. Okay. See you in the pub night. <laughs> I'm going to try. I totally forgot last night. That was just sad. so quiet isn't it usually when we do these things everybody's going hello 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 and it's like a big huge echo one of the, the things i i miss most about well presbytery gatherings and then being together for regional gatherings i mean you miss the fellowship and the community of meals but just the meal itself right that you didn't have to cook it that someone cooked it for you that was put together uh and I know definitely from Presbytery experience from, you know, being time in Northern Ontario and having moose meat feature on the menu for Presbyteries. Oh, cool. uh, and then here in Southern Alberta, you know, going to see uh, our friends at Tabor who always put together lovely meals. Um, I, I miss those opportunities to take in some of those, those wonderful foods uh, from different towns and church places because everybody's got their specialty, right? Great. That's like Joanne said yesterday morning in part of the worship, mm -hmm. how that, that potluck, that gathering for meals brings everybody and everything together in ways that we just don't normally do. Maybe we should have people share, share a menu or an identification of what they had for lunch and then we would have a virtual potluck. <laughs> <laughs> well, food food pictures are a thing in social media. I know I've posted some. There you go. Chris had tacos. Ah, delicious. <laughs> I, I made egg salad. So you might be glad you're not here. <laughs> Chicken <laughs> pecanra. Oh, oh, borscht. Delicious, Susan. Oh, is it homemade oh, look borscht? At this. Did someone give you, well, there you go. Indian food. Wow. You see, in a church, if you say food, all of a sudden there's engagement. <laughs> I love it. And I have to say, egg sandwiches are so church. I mean, you go to anything, there has to be egg sandwiches there. Hi, Kathy. But Hi. did they cut the crusts? I, I just yeah. sent David uh, the, the minutes for the nominating committee process. Okay. Okay. It's, it's, quite, it's quite lovely and organized. <laughs> she says. Thank, thank you, Kathy. I'm, I'm, I'll have a look at those and we will um, take the salient points that need to be communicated. And if there's any questions, I'll, I'll talk to the nominating committee as well. Okay, sounds good. What you Gary had a this? can of cold beans for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. What I was saying go. was, does an egg salad, salad sandwich really count if they don't cut the crusts off? Ah. Very yeah. true. <laughs> Very true, homemade bread. Susan was saying that she made her borscht from the garden, uh, favorite end of summer activity. Uh, oh, I think nice. I'm going to go to High River because there's nothing like vegetables out of the garden. Uh, and one of my favorites is borscht. It's a dish my mom made somewhat infrequently, but whenever she did, you know, you put the sour cream in it and then you eat the borscht and it's a very Ukrainian, and as a second generation Ukrainian person, I just love potato soup and borscht and anything with garlic yeah you see i don't understand beets <laughs> <laughs> my partner and i we bonded over our mutual dislike of beets <laughs> well, well, i personally just think they taste like dirt <laughs> my, my spouse's uh, grandmother um took us to various restaurants and various buffets in London, Ontario, based on the quality of their pickled beets. We have to go here because they have good beets. And so maybe it's a Southern Ontario, Alberta, Prairie thing, but beets are, are wonderful. Or maybe it's a Dwight Schrute thing for you Oasis fans, you know? <laughs> okay, well, we've got a couple of minutes left. They're coming in. They're coming in. And of course, in our neck of the woods, sugar beets are a thing. What's the difference? Uh, sugar beets, they refine into sugar. Oh. Come to Tabor sometime. Okay. 
Well, we'll, we'll um, when, when Trina finally gets a chance to make her way down to Southern Alberta, we'll take her on a beat tour. We won't make her eat them, but we'll, we'll show her. You're how saying you don't want me to come? <laughs> I, I'm saying we can show you how beets figure into the, both the socioeconomic and political economies of Southern Alberta. <laughs> Surprisingly. And all this because we didn't have lunch together. <laughs> okay, so we're getting close to two o'clock. So I'll just remind us that sometimes if we don't have our videos on, it makes our um, sound a little bit better. Um, you don't get quite so much waving, wavering around. So you choose. But if it, uh, if it sounds really weird and you've got your video on, we're going to blame you. Okay. So I'm going to invite us to begin our afternoon together and I'm quite looking forward to this. Our theme is radical inclusion. And one of the things for me about radical inclusion is that sometimes the plans that we have are, um, need some tweaking, need some changing, need a moment. And so I'm going to invite us into a moment. We have one in our community who is um, in hospital and struggling, and their family is struggling to offer support and strength, and they are asking for our prayers. And so I'm just going to ask us to include this family in our time together for a moment, and I would invite you to join me in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for your love and support in all the times of our life. And especially today, we hold in our hearts all those in our region and around your world who are struggling, who are hurting, who are looking for ways to support loved ones, who need peace in their hearts. God, we ask that you surround them and hold them in their struggles and let them know that we too are thinking of them and sending all that we can to help them on this journey. Amen. And so we return to the indoubtable Yvette Flunder and um, we'll get Trina to take on the um, facilitation of this again and please enjoy and engage in this experience of radical inclusion. Well after yesterday's session I don't think Bishop Flunder requires any further introduction so thank you very much for the gifts that you brought us yesterday and uh, for your gift of time in being with us today and so without further ado over to you. Hello, friends. I feel very blessed and pleased to be here. A am I coming in well on audio? Yes. Excellent. I have been practicing saying about in the place of about. Uh, <laughs> and I'm doing pretty good with it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, if you're from the Maritimes, you'd have to say a boot. A boot. <laughs> oh, my God. I have, to, I have to train myself again. How about that? <laughs> Well, it is my joy to be with you all today, and uh, I want to share today in our, our progression as we are going along talking about what inclusion and radical inclusion really looks like for the church and for religion and in many ways for our countries and societies. And today, we are going to the book of Numbers. In the 11th chapter, 16th and 17th, and then the 24th through 30th verse. And I want to read just a few verses and then share with you some thoughts and hopes that we will have some opportunity to have exchanges. I encourage you to prepare comments and questions. My hope, and I believe the hope of the, all of those who have engaged in organizing this time, is that we will be able to talk to one another. I would like that very much, by the way. So let's go to Numbers, the 11th chapter, the 16th verse. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, 
whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them up from the camp to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with us. I will come down, I will talk to you there, and I will take some of the spirit which is upon you, Moses, and put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. So Moses went out and told the people the word of the Lord. He gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them round about the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, took some of the spirit, the anointing that was upon Moses and put it upon the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied or they spoke forth, but they did so no more. Hmm. Now the two men remained in the camp. There were two men who remained in the camp. One was named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. They were among those registered or those called to be leaders, but they had not gone out to the tent for they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the minister of Moses, one of the chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. But Moses said to them, Are you jealous for my sake? For whose sake are you jealous, Joshua? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put the Lord's spirit upon them. And Moses and the elders of Israel left the tent of meeting and returned to the camp. It's a powerful story with so many nuances that connect so powerfully to our conversation today. So let's visit with Eldad and Medad in the reading from Numbers. These were two brothers apparently in rebellion against the prescribed method for how the spirit moves among God's people. These two brothers were not present for the high meeting and it disturbed the keepers of the protocol when they became filled with the spirit and their witness was not confined to the tent of meeting confab or tent of meeting gathering of the elders and leaders. These men broke protocol and therefore they were deemed unworthy recipients with a counterfeit call at best. Eldad and Medad chose to extol God's attributes and declare God's will and purpose out in the open marketplace, down the hill, in the camp, among the common people. They prophesied without being properly vested or perhaps properly vetted. They prophesied outside of the tent, outside of the denomination, outside of the temple, the prescribed location, wherever it was to do divine work, they prophesied. They prophesied in our day in places like a nightclub or online or at a park or on a stroll in a, at Congress on the steps of the Supreme Court or in recovery centers, in homeless shelters, in other places made holy, other holy places made holy by the words of justice and peace from the living God through God's appointed and anointed servants. The word prophecy in the Hebrew is interestingly interpreted, this word naba, as the powerful meaning to foretell and foretell, to speak of things to come, but to speak forth what it is that God is doing and saying right now. And like Moses, they voiced with power what God was doing and what God's plan was for God's people. 
Then long came Joshua, the protocol officer, who rebuked them. Perhaps Joshua feared that Moses would lose power. If common people could break with protocol and move among the masses, perhaps what made Joshua afraid was that if Moses lost power, he would concomitantly lose power, vicariously lose power. If Moses was pulled down from his place of strength, then what would happen to the Joshua's? But Moses replied from his place of strength, would that all God's people were prophets. Let's hang on to that for a minute. Would that all God's people were prophets. Would that all God's people were prophets. Here's what my years of cutting edge justice work and professional clergy work has taught me. Not all certified faith leaders are prophets. And not all uncertified faith leaders are not prophets. <laughs> not all bishops and pastors and elders and evangelists and reverends and priests and abbots and overseers and shaman and imams are prophets. Not all megachurch leaders are prophets. But what is a true prophet? And what is a true prophetic organization? What is a true prophetic denomination? One that can see and sense what is coming. One that can see and sense what is no longer useful. One that can see and sense and feel what the Spirit is saying today to the church or to the faith-based organizations. And by the way, that's the easy part of being a prophet. That's the easy part of being prophetic. That is the easy part for denominations and organizations and theological schools and groups is to see and sense what is coming. The complicated part is the one who foretells. Let me say it again. To be a true prophet is to foretell to see what is coming, but to foretell means to share it with others. That's the part that's dangerous for individuals and organizations, to foretell. The one who speaks a dangerous career or organizational shifting word of truth to power, out of season, Essentially, an uncomfortable word, one who perhaps puts themselves in harm's way to live out what it means to do justice and to love mercy and to speak truth when it is an inconvenient truth, when it is not popular to speak it, when folks won't join you when you speak it, or big money will leave you when you speak it. Where are the prophets in this? complicated and perilous and difficult time for the whole planet, from country to country, from government to government, from religion to religion, hot spots of illness and storms and fire and war and locusts. Where are the prophets in this time where there are efforts in being made in the United States under the guise of religious freedom to reverse hard-won freedoms for women, for LGBT people, for immigrants. It is like the bash, backlash of what we call Jim Crow or peonage on the heels of the end of chattel slavery and the repentance around how we have treated Native Americans, indigenous people. And here's what I have come to know. It's cyclical the way these oppressions happen. They are almost easy to experience 
and to expect because they are cyclical. And I'll say it the way, the way I say it in my community. Pharaoh still does not make bricks. Pharaoh has always got to have a group of folk that are enslaved or nearly enslaved on the low end of the earning edge. Always there has to be someone low so that another group of people can feel high. And it will take a prophetic voice to stop the epidemics of hatred because if we just treat hatred without decrying hatred, it will rise again. It's like putting a bandage on cancer. It doesn't work. And so the church and religion and our denominations and our theological schools of education need some L dads and me dads. I call them the dad brothers <laughs> or perhaps the, the dad sisters. Voices ready to deal with issues, church politics, human sexuality, poverty, reparations, the human crisis at our borders, active assaults against our one only planet, the concerted effort to destroy our international relationships, country to country. And we need L dads and me dads to raise up nations that will speak peace, to confront the effort to proliferate guns. It's time, and if we don't do it, if we don't hurry and do it, some things will be beyond reparations. And I say this as a disciple of a brown Palestinian Jew who was murdered, crucified by a coalition of religion working with empire. Voices willing to confess the use of religion as a weapon of oppression need to make some noise about it. A voice not afraid to admit that folks just hate some people. And then they use the Bible to justify preconceived prejudices and pejorative assumptions. We need some eldads and medads to be a voice that will look at the history and culture of oppressions in all of our countries, in all of our providence, prov provinces and states and vow not to emulate the oppressions that we have both experienced and benefited from. Folks like Eldad and Medad who broke ranks with tradition and politics and custom and practice and left, came down from the mountain, went into the city, into the village, into the valley, in and among the people and rubbed shoulders and spoke face to face with those who had been determined less than. And may I make this aside before we talk today. I understand Joshua, the protocol officer. <laughs> I was raised in a Joshua church where we were taught to confine the spirit blessing to those that came into our tent, who are a part of our church, a part of our denomination, had our culture and obeyed our rules. We were taught to come out from among the world and be separate. We used the scripture that said, touch not, taste not, handle not the unclean thing. We were classical Pentecostals. But even that was not the Pentecostal message. The message of Acts 2 was not that the spirit would be confined. The message of Acts 2 was that the spirit would be available to all people, the whole purpose. <laughs> of it coming on the day of Pentecost was because a whole pack of people were in town and were going to leave town with the Spirit's blessing, not having to conform to the religion of those that came down the stairs. The Spirit would not be confined to a burning bush. The Spirit would not be confined to the inner sanctum of the Holy of Holies or the sweeping bell towers and flying buttresses and upper rooms or a chosen race of people. But on the day that the spirit slipped out of the tabernacle and went to Eldad and Medad, 
slipped out of the tent of meeting and moved into the camp and anointed Eldad and Medad. And in my imagination, Eldad and Medad would have gone down where the people had tattoos and jeans and cowboy boots and miscellaneous piercings and such, just to confuse everybody. Imagine the spirit being poured out on those that most of us may think were the least likely to receive it. But the spirit slipped out of every desperate effort made to confine the spirit to a culture, a denomination, a doctrine, and blanketed the earth with the opportunity to know the God who is not limited by the lines we draw to exclude. Some said the spirit would not show up in Macedonia during Peter's ministry, but Peter found out God was blessing the Italians with the same blessing as God blessed the Jews. In my generation, some say the spirit won't show up in the hip hop culture or at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Some would say the spirit won't move among Asian folks or tattooed motorcycle riding youth or same gender loving or trans people or dozens and multiplied thousands of young people saying Black Lives Matter. The spirit is supposed to stay in the prescribed tent. And someone is saying, stop these people. They do not follow the rules. Surely they cannot be filled with the spirit and prophesy like us. But there's a new message, my beloved. It is the message of radical inclusion. It is a come out message. Come out, come out from wherever you are. The real Pentecostal message is not a go hide message, it's a go ye. <laughs> go ye into all the world with the message of good news. Come out of the rooms and the cloisters and the inner sanctums, go down the stairs, go into the street, share the good news of God in languages and by methods. What is the true sanctuary? What are the real sacraments? Do they have to be steepled? Do they have to be little bread and wine? Or can they be done at Starbucks over a bagel and a cup of coffee? Methods that are as diverse as our creator's great creation. So when Peter spoke at that great Pentecostal meeting, he recounted the vision of the prophet Joel where the spirit is poured out on all flesh. Spirit is moving. The time is right. The stage is set, United Church of Canada. Out of our bellies, our innermost beings should flow rivers and springs of living water. Glory in, glory out. Water in, water out. Love in, love out. Peace in, peace out, spirit in, spirit out. We are not designed to contain and confine the presence of God, the spirit of God, the grace of God. We are in fact designed to conduct it. <laughs> spirit comes to fill us, move through us, deposit in us, and then bubble up like a fountain overflowing moving through the earth from home to church, to community, to halfway houses, to Alcoholics Anonymous, to homeless shelters, to seats of government, throughout the cosmos, transcending time and space, spirit moving from the tent of meeting, from the upper room, into the crowds, into the street, into the homes, everyone included. Spirit-filled people making a great mark, working to bring even more marginalized and alienated and unchurched and religious, not but spiritual, yes, people to the table of God. The work of finding ways and reasons to exclude has never been the work of the Spirit. This is our defining moment. I dare say we are on the brink of a great reformation, a spirit refreshing. We will not come out of the COVID-19 epidemic the way we went in. We will turn 
the exclusivity of religion to the inclusivity of our extravagant God. God bless you is my prayer. Thank you. So I wonder if folks can engage the invitation to be in conversation uh, with each other and with Bishop Flunder around her words and thoughts. So I'll invite you to do that by uh, writing comments in the comments section. Seeing lots of amens and wow, so thank you. To exclude has never been the work of the spirit. Folks are just needing a minute to settle into your words. So let's just have a moment to do that. Okay, so one question, I wonder what specifically is in COVID that gives us this opportunity? Why do we think the church will take this time when they have missed so many other opportunities? Can you hear me? Can now, yep. Yeah. Excellent. Um, in my opinion, what COVID has taught us, the real, real lesson, practical lesson, is that we have many other ways to communicate. There are many local experiences that have now become nationwide and in some cases across the world that did not know that they had the opportunity or the, the call or the ability, frankly, to really reach out. We have been extraordinarily creative. It took us a minute as faith-based organizations and churches to figure out what buttons to push <laughs> And obviously, we're still trying to get it together. But it is becoming more simple for us to be more versatile, useful in several ways. And I think it is as different as when we, people came across the Atlantic Ocean by ship and when we started to fly, same Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> But one will get you there a whole heap faster. It's the same thing as the difference between mail by post and mail by email. We didn't conceive before we got email that we could contact 500 people with one button stroke. <laughs> That's an amazing reality. So I believe that something has shifted, some division between us, some distance and space between us, and it has allowed us to be in touch with and in communion with one another in completely different and broader and wider ways. It also means that we are not constricted in our outreach to a geographical location, even in our cities, even in our close proximity. So the sick, the, the infirmed, those that are, are homebound either by their own health or the health of a loved one, hospital bound, all of those opportunities have been made very clear to us. So I am very, very aware that things have changed dramatically. And I just don't think we're gonna come out of this with as narrow a scope. I think we've become much more universal as a result of what it is that we've experienced, yes. Thank you. Uh, Alwyn is saying, I have been reading the Facebook and someone posted, we need spirit filled people in the pulpit. Uh, oops, Not academically trained people. What is your response to that? I think that people should be both. I think it is problematic when one or the other is absent. 
because uh, I believe that it is the work of the spirit that informs our academics. We can be extremely problematic doing God's work without God's spirit <laughs> informing us, essentially. So I think that it is the spirit of God that informs what it is that we have learned, uh, what it is that we are learning, because my hope is that we are full-time students, even when we're out of the academy. So what we are learning, I believe the Spirit of God informs and uses. Uh, training gives the Spirit fodder, substance to work with, to help us to do what it is that we do. It is in some ways the language or the method that helps us to do, but, what we, but we are definitively to do it as an act of the leading of or the direction of the spirit. We're spirit people. We're spirit filled people. And that is what makes or ignites what it is that we have learned. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Helen, I suppose she could say her own question, but I often, I have often thought and heard lay folks say, oops, my screen's jumping around here, that the spirit speaks as well through one another, or as well through one as another. What power over others are we claiming when we say God needs me to be with you? I believe, well, first of all, I believe that commune, the being together is the sum total of us together, working together as body, sort of a Paul's concept of what, how can the hand say to the foot, I have no need of thee, I have no need of you. I believe that we are at, uh, by the will of God in God's intention, we are joined together by the spirit of God. And so I don't uh, uh, suppose that there are people that need me. I am aware, however, that it is true and open to how the Spirit leads me and us in the direction of people who need our help. And I also need other people. You know, I am in community and I have great need to have the help and the support of those who help and support me. That's an, an, an active part of who I am and an active part of what I am called to. I do believe that that is in some ways the definition of ecclesia, of church, that we are a body of believers working together to share what it is that Jesus taught us to do, and that is to pray your realm or your kingdom come and your will be done on earth <laughs> as it is in heaven. And we do that with one another. We do that joined together with one another. So yeah, I, I, I don't assume that there are people that need me or that I have something that can be of assistance to other people. I'm aware that that's true, but I'm also aware that there are people that I need, that I'm not designed to travel this journey uh, as, a, as an, a single person on a journey alone, you know? We are a community of people across race, across language, across economic strata, all with something that can assist someone else. You cook the bread, I'll cook the meat, somebody else cooks the vegetable, somebody else makes the dessert, and we can have a meal. <laughs> that, that is my feeling about it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm reading these questions because not everybody has access to the chat. We've got people joining us through YouTube and Facebook as well as in here. So, uh, so for those of you who can see them, thank you for your grace in this. Um, so Dave Pollard says, it's one thing for us to hear that exclusivity to will uh, give way to inclusivity of an extravagant God as leaders, but many of the people we serve in the institution of church is predicated on a stained glass hearing of the gospel. How does the church, so concerned about survival of the institution, get on board with the idea of conduit of the spirit? With great struggle. 
I want to put that out there because we are very connected. You know, if you've ever stopped and wondered, why is it that the worship hour is the most racially segregated hour almost of any time among people of faith? Because, and I, and I pretty much come to the conclusion that we, what we have are the cultural realities that draw us to be in communion with people who have similar cultural realities. So I said to you that I was raised by classical Pentecostals. That's the truth. And the sound of classical, of classical Pentecostal service, everybody claps on the two and the four. I just need everybody to know that, right? <laughs> we, have, we have a full drum set. We have, in most of those services, we have a B3 organ, a jazz organ, a piano, several tambourines, and some other things that we use. You know, I, I mean, the old folks when I was coming along used to bring two spoons together with a rubber band and, and make rhythm on their hands with spoons or rub boards and a spoon. What, what, what was that? That, that, that? that was culture. That was the reality of being a person of African descent. That was the reality of being a person of African descent Immersed, emerging from people who, who did church the way folks do church in the deep south of the United States. It was a sound that I'm acquainted with. But I do, without any difficulty, make a distinct difference between the sound and the cadence and the clapping on the two and the four. That was a part of my being a part of African-American, descended from slaves, up from the South, classical Pentecostals. I know the difference between that than when I am with the whirling dervishes who are Muslim, or the difference when I am in an Episcopal church when most of the liturgy is sung, right? And, and most of the words are prescribed. It's very different when I went to the Catholic church and, and had buried one of my staff people through a requiem mass at the Catholic church and the priest said, if you are a Catholic in good standing, that you could come for the Eucharist. And I got up and went and took the Eucharist. I listened to the other people, how they did it. <laughs> and I said, oh, Catholic in good standing, I, I, I have to be at least, <laughs> even though I don't know altogether what I have to do to be one. I'm just gonna just determine that I am one because I'm in the Lord's church. And I went up there and, and I, I took my, my little bread and I got my juice and went and sat down. I just watched what the other people did. I went, and because my belief is if I'm with people of spirit and people who know the divine, I am at home. The rest is culture. Culture that informs theology and theology that informs culture. I'll just go a step further. I was in the Holy Land at the, the, the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. And I went to be uh, among the, um, all of the, 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 the churches that are Orthodox, one of which was an Ethiopian Orthodox group. And they were just a singing the song. And the only word that I recognized was hallelujah. So when I, they gave me a song book and assumed that I might've been them, I'm sort of the, the color and the grade of hair that that group was. And so I got my book, I couldn't read anything. But I listened to the song long enough until I realized when the hallelujahs came in. And when they got to hallelujah, I sang hallelujah. And then they sang some more stuff. Then they sang hallelujah and I sang hallelujah. And pretty soon we had the best time. We sang together. We danced together. We loved one another together. And I felt as much at home as I could, not knowing how to speak with folks from Addis Ababa. And that is the truth. <laughs> My, my heart to you is, it's not a putting down, a dismissing of the things that have become the culture. There are things about an ordered church process that work for some people. There are things about a free flowing church process that work for people. There are a lot, those are not the things that I'm really talking about. What I'm talking about is that part of us that feels that one of them is greater or better or higher or more important to God. 
that we would have to have it in the tent and we couldn't have it among the people. It is that part, it is that power over dynamic, it is that we're more, we're greater, we're more sophisticated, we're closer, we're deeper, we're stronger. Our understanding, our interpretation of the word, whatever we consider the word to be, is more powerful. And there are seven or so baptisms in the Christian church. And do you know every single one of them quote from scripture? How is it conceivable that it is clear how we're supposed to baptize people if we baptize them seven different ways <laughs> and all of us say it's what the Bible says? <laughs> Obviously, something has happened and culture has taken the place. I'm not opposed to that. I have culture. I have sounds that I prefer. I have songs that I sing when I worship all alone by myself. But that is not the real question. The real question is, do we have eyes to see beyond the tent of meeting on the top of the hill? Can we see, can we see at all being able to be radically inclusive, opening ourselves up to our differences and finding a way to serve those most in need of all of us? Is there a way that we can do that? And I believe that we are greater than the walls that divide us. That's a long answer to a short question, but nonetheless, I think it was a very important question. Thank you. Just a comment in response to that from Wilma. I'll never forget the first sermon I heard that we are all ministers of the word with the spirit leading us. We have moved a little. Where the average congregant can handle, a simple average person can minister to them. Yes. So that's great. And the next question. I am interested in how to connect a message yesterday around relationship across divisions, including genuine confrontation when appropriate, and today's message about the spirit not being constrained into our expectations. Any comments? Well, I don't find those things in conflict with one another, right? Because we do have to be able to reach across divisions. And it is important that we find ways to see the God and the good in people who are different from ourselves. It's incredibly important that we do that. Simultaneously, there are times when someone has to move out and move forward. Who breaks the tie? Do, do you understand what my heart is saying? Who, who is it that speaks into it and says, you know, there are people down here in town who can't come to the, up to the tent who is going to go and minister to them? And will we see those people as odd <laughs> and strange and peculiar? Much the same way that the chief priests saw Jesus, very odd and disturbing. Jesus was very disturbing, you know, because he was siphoning people off. They were following him in reasonably large numbers. If we are to believe what we read of him, it was making the temple folks really good and pissed off <laughs> what it was that was happening, right? So I don't, I don't see a, a difference, a distinct difference. Let's, let's put it that way. When our ministry is including um, the, the work of working with the person who is our enemy, such as was Paul, who was once Saul, who went to kill the church at Damascus, right? And our working with him. I don't see that as problematic over against the conversation of what happened with Eldad and Medad. Because in some ways, what Eldad and Medad did was as revolutionary as what Ananias did when he decided to hear the spirit of God and to be the pastor of the one who came to destroy him. Both of these realities are radical. If there is a common denominator, it is that if we are going to do the work of justice, the, the work, let me say it another way, the issues that our world is having right now call for a radical response. We are in a bit of a mess. <laughs> it's not the first time humankind has been in a mess. But we are certainly in one 
that has not only evolved into something that is making the world amazingly small by virtue of our ability to travel, by virtue of our ability to connect with one another virtually. So we are feeling it, the impact of what is going on right now. And the ones that we're not even talking about, like the massive locusts that are, 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 have fallen upon East Africa. It is, it is amazing, along with the calving of the glaciers, along with the fact that we are having these incredible storms now in the Gulf, along with what is happening politically, along with the fact that we have yet another pandemic and possibly one following it. What an in incredible time for the church to come alive and to find more ways to connect and to do the work of radical justice than to just sort of sit back and see how it goes and protect the things that are close to us, the things that make us comfortable. Are we going to be uncomfortable? Yes. All of us in some ways are gonna be made uncomfortable if we are really going to make change happen. Are we gonna make some of us upset and angry? Probably, <laughs> probably. But if we're going to make change, if we're going to have a voice, if we're going to do something, at least let's have at least as much boldness as our young people have who are walking through the streets, half of which are not black children and they are saying black lives matter. What does that say? What is, what is that vision? What is that in terms of, of the courage that these young people have and how can they have that level of courage? And those of us who are not young people, who know, who really know the beginnings of a lot of these things, that we don't seek to have courage. And you, maybe there are things that you cannot do. There are things that I cannot do. I'm 65 years old, sisters and brothers. Okay? Just black doesn't wrinkle up very quickly, but I'm trying to tell you that I'm 65. For real, okay? <laughs> it's just really the truth. But my truth is, I still have my things that I can do. Age ought to bring wisdom. And there are some things that I can do. There are some things that all of us can do. We'll go up in the attic and get our signs and get our Birkenstocks and get ready to go. Make sure we are putting our voice and our feelings and our power. And the Spirit of God will direct us if we are ready for change. I know I've over-talked, but you have to be ready to shift. The whole planet is shifting. God forbid that the church will not see this time for radical inclusion and extravagant grace and relentless hospitality. That is my prayer. Thank and you. We, we love to hear you talk, so don't, don't <laughs> feel like you're over-talking. <laughs> it's wonderful. Thank you for listening. Um, Bill Moore is asking, in times of COVID, it is difficult to keep in touch with the disenfranchised, the addicts for many, who, many of whom don't have online ability. Do you have any suggestions on how to better keep in touch as we walk with the spirit giving outreach on the streets? That is so powerful. People who are addicted, people who are dealing with mental and emotional challenges, uh, people who are housing insecure, they don't have technology, and you're absolutely right. And um, one of the ways that I can say that has happened among us, uh, and when I say us, I mean the United Church of Christ, but I want to say specifically also at City of Refuge, where I've been the pastor for 30 years, Jesus. <laughs> uh, and, and some churches throughout the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, over which I have some responsibility to lead. I think that um, what we have done is created things that help to draw people to us. And when it's done enough times in a city, or in a province, or in an area, then we can reach many more people because the word does really get out. When we draw them to us, what we do is we provide, now that the COVID has come, we provide food that we prepackage in bags and boxes. We used to let people come into our pantry, which is quite large in our building uh, and get what they wanted. 
but now what we have to do is prepare it because we cannot be in direct contact in the ways in which we were. But we do prepare it and we just have tables and tables of boxes and bags. And while people are there with us, we also offer testing and we also uh, offer uh, referrals to our clinic so they can get the help that they need there. Across the street from us, we're in relationship with a couple of the hotels, one of which houses people who are living with active COVID and as they come from the hospital and need to quarantine, and the other is for senior citizens uh, and elders who are also housing insecure. And so I think it's around partnerships, churches and faith-based organizations that partner with other organizations that have a hands-on uh, contact with folks in the area where we are who have mental health issues, who have substance abuse issues, who have homeless or housing insecure issues, the other group that needs an enormous amount of help are parents who have to work, um, that are essential workers as they're called in the US, but people who have to work sometimes simply because they have to eat, they have to work. <laughs> and they are also homeschooling their children simultaneously. And it's a challenge. Some of the children are learning things that the parents don't know how to teach at home. And then it's a matter of who is going to care for the children while the parents are gone. And we can create ways to have pods of parents and people that can help and can assist, uh, can do some homeschooling, whatever ways we can go about that. If we can develop those training or teaching pods at our church buildings. For people, if we can help the children in the absence of lunch when they come home from school, there's so many things we can do because we have access to, and these are not expensive expensive things. These are, are time and people things, things that we can do to make a definitive difference uh, in our community. And that, I believe, would cause people to see the hands and heart of God in some of these epidemic realities that we're dealing with. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. There's a fairly animated conversation going on among people about the earlier question around uh, spirit-filled ministry and academic ministry. I'm not yeah. going to read all those comments, but uh, it, has like sparked, <laughs> it has sparked a little bit of conversation, so that's yeah. great. But just following along the lines of your last question, um, thanks for your words today. What do you imagine God is saying to us in the midst of COVID-19? Well, let me touch just a little bit on the academic and, and um, spirit-filled realities and say it to you this way. Um, and I have three degrees. You may know, you know that, I, and I teach. So I spend a, a little time in academia, particularly theological education. Um, and it's important that I say to you, from a practical standpoint, that the first thing I did was business. And it probably was as much help to have a, a business degree with, a, with, a, with an emphasis on accounting, hallelujah. It probably was as much help as my theological degrees have been <laughs> as it relates to doing the work in the inner city, which I call the third world of the United States. We are always having to find resources all the time. It's perpetual. The people with the greatest needs and the least amount to contribute to their own care takes a lot of creative things. And not just, I'm not speaking about this charitably. I'm talking about restoration, restoring people to wholeness and their self-care, their ability to do what they need to do for themselves is expensive work and hard work. But that was not taught to me in the institutions of theological education. And I'm not minimizing theological education. I think, however, it should be paired with practical application. Practical application. If we're going to deal with seniors, if we're going to deal with people who are mentally, emotionally uh, challenged, if we're going to deal with people who are homeless, if we're going to do public policy work, if we're going to write grants, if we're going to intervene in an epidemic, if we're going to deal with children and youth, there are some things that we need to know that I think that in many cases, a theological education only is bereft of. Some of the people who are the most skilled among us are people who came to theological education as a second career and had something else that they added that to and built on it. People who go directly into it, I think that 
because theological education institutions are becoming less and less present in the United States, are having to partner with one another, but many of them are partnering with liberal arts schools and universities. So people can have a, have a, a degree that is both a theological education piece and nonprofit law piece, <laughs> or theological education and counseling, a theological education and, and childhood education, okay? So that there's a way to both temper one with the other because when you get, as most of the pastors know who are on the line, when you get in the real world, you're gonna need to know some things in order to really create a community center type worship era experience so that you are serving people what is needed theologically, but simultaneously you are seeking to care for the other needs that also they bring into those moments and times and places. And the less our governments will fund those things, the more faith-based organizations and churches are going to be called upon to do that work. What I'm saying to you, I have said many times to ATS and other um, uh, organizations that have oversight of theological education, we need practical community type things, depending on what it is we're going to be doing, added to our theological education. I think it's powerfully important, but particularly for people whose first soiree in tertiary education is theological education. Another way I may say it is my education as a theologian did not teach me one thing about crack cocaine. And when I got on the ground and started ministering to people in a crack epidemic, in a heroin epidemic, when, in a methamphetamine epidemic on the street, when I got on the ground, I had to do some real work to catch up quick. <laughs> the inner city is the third world to catch up quick in order to do that. So that is a discussion I hope we keep having. How can we empower people who are going to do this justice work about public policy, about grant writing, about the things that are necessary for us to show up and be able to really have an important part of the discourse. That is important to me. So now I have forgotten the second question that you, that you asked me. Was it, I'm sorry. What was this? What did you ask me? I can't hear you. Sorry. It's that, it's that you are muted quote that is the, the, the phrase of 2020. Yes. Um, what do you imagine God is saying to us in the midst of COVID-19? That's a question from John Pentland. Thank you, John, for asking the question. And I, I do believe, because this is one in a long line of epidemics, it's not the first one. Um, and let me say that in my engagement with HIV and AIDS began when it was, when it was GRID, um, gay-related immunodeficiency, just so you know how it started, before it became HIV. Uh, I want to say that 30 years since we, since this virus happened and it's still here. I just need for that to sit among us for a minute and realize that HIV and AIDS is still killing people. That's important for me to say. Um, pandemics have happened over and over and over again. And I might also add that the church has performed poorly <laughs> historically. <laughs> Um, and has, has thought many times about the apocalypse and the coming of Jesus. And of course, there's lots of apocalyptic conversation out there now because we won't accept the realities of global warming and we won't accept the realities. And, and apocalypse, which is an interesting dynamic to me, apocalyptic eschatology or the end times is being taught by the people who don't want to wear a mask more than the people who do want to wear one, which I find also extremely interesting uh, among our people. But I think that there are lessons to be learned about cross-species pandemics, such as the avian flu, such as uh, the beginnings of HIV, which probably began in a simian contact, a blood-to-blood -blood contact of some sort um, in Africa. And the realities of this particular epidemic, it has to, a lot to do with uh, the fact that we have had them and are going to continue to have them. Great revivals were born out of the cholera epidemic. And all they had to do, by the way, was boil the water, but they didn't know that, right? 
Uh, there's, a, there's a lot I could say about how this happens. I suspect that as long as humankind exists, it's going to continue to happen, especially if it becomes politicized, much the way that this particular virus, just like HIV was politicized. This one is being politicized. What is the message to the church? The message to the church is to care for the sick and dying and to do everything that we can do to take care of ourselves because our first responsibility is to our bodies and then to do what we can, not allow religion and politics to get in the way of once we find out how a virus is, how it moves from one person to another in the human family, let's not go stupid. <laughs> let's, not, let's not go into a, a whole lot of different kinds of, of, of political positions or religious positions. If I can cough it on you, I need to make sure that I don't cough on you. How about that? <laughs> If it is sexually transmitted, I need to make sure that I am either repressing the virus in my system or I'm making sure that I am not having unprotected sex. You know, I think that there, it's, it's logical, it's sensible, and it, it becomes something when it's really big that is somehow an act of God. But pandemics are oftentimes an act of the lack of knowledge of how it is essentially spread and then a lack of desire to do what we need to do to reduce it. Polio has not disappeared. The plague has not disappeared. What has happened is it was reduced long enough for humankind to build enough in our own immunosystems to push back against it, either over time of getting infected or because we had an immunogen that was given to us in a shot so that we would not pass the virus to, from one to another. It's not, that part's not rocket science. What is rocket science is human beings. <laughs> and the way we spin out that has now allowed six million plus people in my country alone. It's, it's amazing all over the world, just amazing how many people have been infected. It is simply amazing to me what has happened uh, and because of the ways that it has been caught up politically. And people have died. I know people who have died. I know the parents of many who have died. We don't need to do that. And religion needs to play a positive part in helping people to live. Yes. Thanks, and I'm reflecting on the application of that in the, in the other health crisis we've got going on in Canada, which is the overdose uh, crisis and the, yes. the um, poison drug supply here that, that we're dealing with. Um, another comment from Amy Mueller. Why do we need to be with each other and what is radical inclusion to my mind? Listening to Bishop Flunder, I am circling back to Trinity. I think when we uphold Trinity, we uphold relationship. We recognize we don't exist without others. And so maybe part of radical inclusion is a deep understanding that we are not whole without others, all others. Yes, I agree with that. I am your sister, your mother, your aunt, your friend, your colleague, and I want to be. It is my desire to be. I don't you know, have a lot of fakery in me, trust me. It is my desire to be, because there are things that you know. I, I cannot explain to you chitlins, okay? It's gonna take all day to talk about chitlins as, as a delicacy in my family, the entrail of pigs, that my family and poor black people who were raised up from slavery ate what we call low on the hog, not high on the hog. So we got the chitlins and the stomach and the, and the pig feet and the pig tail and the pig snoot and the pig head. That's the way our folks learned to cook because everybody else got the nice stuff. So I can't explain chitlins to you or, or why I would have a palate for chitlins except to say that I was raised it. And I'll tell you something, you don't come into chitlins late in life. You have to have been raised on them. You don't just pick up and go to eating them later on, trust me. But I'm pretty sure, I, I mean, I, 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 don't, I can't do kimchi. I can't eat it for smelling it, if you understand. I, mean, I, I don't do blood sausage. You know, there's some other things that, that I'm sure that are unique to Canada 
Eat. There you go. You know, how about tripe? Jesus. I mean, you know, there's stuff I just don't eat. I don't have a palate for it, beloved. But that does not mean that I'm not, I'm, I'm not okay with you eating it. <laughs> I need you to be okay with my chitlins. Okay? Yeah, we, have, we have got to find a way not to have to minimize what is different. Different is just that, different. But we have a sameness underneath our skin, underneath our ep epidermis is the dermis, under that is what is called subcutaneous fat. Hallelujah. But our epidermis, when our epidermis is gone, that is where our pigmentation is. There is no more pigment after that. We are the same hearts, blood, livers, kidneys. We are the same. We have more sameness than we have apartness. If we can just get beyond the superficial realities that separate us. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And I, I didn't know where the expression high on the hog came from before today. So mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> That's great. That's right. I see Tammy, pickle pig feet, cotton, <laughs> moose nose. Yes, ma'am. That's what I see. I never had moose nose. And I'm not pining to have it. I just want to. <laughs> well, if you come up, we'll make sure you get some. <laughs> oh, no. Just a taste. I'll taste just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Trevor Potter is saying, thanks for mentioning the environment. We have to be truthful that the earth, the elements of earth, the creatures are enslaved to privilege, urbanization, pharaoh. They all have sentience and spirit and are deeply, deeply marginalized. How are we listening in deep humility to return to earth? This is all tied to our human marginalization too. Oh, it's so true. You know, I, I read um, of the book Sapien. Some of you all probably have read Sapien. Um, it's a great book. Um, and and the, the bottom line of it is for me that there's, there's, I believe in the combination of evolution and creation. I, I believe that there's, an, there's a beginning um, for all things life and, and it has to have come from the eternal if it's essentially something made the first spark spark let's put it that way but the question of what happened over time in terms of how if we came through the mammalian line and that our closest relatives are the simians and the simians brains grew and in, grew into Cro-Magnon and Homo sapiens sapien which is who we are from Homo sapien to Homo sapiens sapien and that we have a big enough brain to imagine the holy and the divine. Why don't we have a big enough brain to take care of the planet? It just amazes me, right? And if that big enough brain that is able to capture the holy and the divine, if, that, if our brains don't begin to realize that this is our planet and this is our home, if we destroy it for human beings to dwell on it, then something else will emerge. And so in my family the other night, the big conversation was, <laughs> The earth, the earth lasts, which it likely will, much longer than us if we don't stop doing what we're doing. What will be the species that will grow a big enough brain to have it inhabited by an understanding of a creator? This is a huge, heavy duty, uh, round the table conversation that we were having. And if we all came to the same conclusion at the same time, we said probably cockroaches. <laughs> because they are so universally resilient, okay? And just about every extinction, they have a relative. <laughs> One of these days, they'll get tall enough and their brains will get big enough and, and maybe they'll take over. But, but all playing aside, if we don't stop this, we will make our planet uninhabitable for us as a species. It just is not going to be, we just won't be able to go on. And what is problematic for us is religion has taught us an, an, an apocalyptic eschatology, again, that we're all going to go to heaven and God is going to blow the whole earth up. It's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and the earth is going to be blown up by the hands of an angry God, which may well be a precursor to what we're going to do if we don't stop doing what we're doing. 
But it is that kind of teaching. Why am I worried about it? It's an evangelical teaching. Why am I worried about the earth? If the earth's going to blow up, we're all going to go to heaven. Why am I trying to keep the water clean? And that is foolishness. The earth is our place and our responsibility and our mother and the same components and the same things that are in the soil are the things that are in our bodies. We are from her. We are part of her. And how is it conceivable that we would not care for her? That is amazing to me. So that is also something that got lost in conservative religion, our responsibility to and for the earth. I'm glad to be talking to some Canadians today about this because you are much better with this than we are down here in the United States, believe me. So thank you for raising those questions. There's a couple of comments in Whova that the cockroach is the new spirit animal for ministers navigating change and transition. How about that? <laughs> because that's a resilient bug. Right? <laughs> all different sizes and colors all over the world. They are tough, I have to tell you. <laughs> well, and definitely resilience is, is what's going to get us through. Okay. Another question from uh, Mauricio. I have several friends in the LGBTQ2S plus community that have been hurt by the church. I sometimes don't even tell people that I attend service regularly so that I'm not judged as being one of those people. Yep. How can I reconcile my faith with my LGBTQ2S plus community? Do you have any suggestions? That's so powerful, you know, uh, and, and I say that um, again, as a woman who has experienced what I have come to call multiple exiles in my life. Um, as a woman clergy person, uh, as a person of African descent, all of those things you know, you understand. And as a same gender loving woman, who by the way, I'll say again, I was not alone as a same gender loving woman in the church of my youth. The, the this distinct difference, and Shirley and I celebrated 37 years that we've been together. The distinct difference between us and the people that we were raised around is that we told the truth. We did not leave people to assumptions. We told the truth about how we felt about one another. And as soon as we got able to do anything legally, um, domestic partnership, the first wave of marriage, the second wave of marriage, everything that we got a chance to do, we did it um, so as to secure one another's lives and to secure the lives of her niece who we raised after her sister died and my daughter, my birth daughter. And so um, I, I understand the oppression of the church. I really do. I understand the ways in which People demean what they do not understand and make small of what they are afraid of. There are people who think that what it is that is in the lives of LGBT, LGBT people and the rest of our alphabet, LGBTQI++++, that it'll jump off on you if you're around them too long, you know, that, and that you'll wake up one day and, and as one old person said, honey, stay away from those people. You, you'll be then gone gay. Okay, I think the concept is <laughs> that it, it's contagious somehow, you know, uh, and it's on the wrong list, even of the people who are trying to be gracious. They say, you know, God loves all people. God loves, you know, ex murderers and, and ex-cons and, and gay people. And I said, no, that's the wrong list. It's, it's more like God loves people of every color, <laughs> of every race, of every sexual expression. That's, you so got to get your list right. So even when you're trying to have the inclusive, you have to be mindful that no, no one in their right mind, particularly someone who was born into church world, would choose to be gay. But I have reached a point in my life where I'm so grateful to have been chosen by God to be same gender love. And that is itself a miracle. And I appreciate it and I'm grateful for it and I'm happy about it, right? And, and I am animated. <laughs> that somehow or other I was chosen, right? Before I was born, that this is who, and it's not because anything happened, nobody raped me or anything like that. It just is my reality. And so what I say to people, when you're wanting to share with folks and folks about, is, is first of all, to say to your congregation, to the church where you are, 
to open up opportunities for con conversation and communication with LGBT people and invite them into circles where there will be a conversation about faith and human sexuality. I would also recommend that we educate ourselves on the many things, because we're talking about a lot of things now. When we talk about the trans community, we're talking about gender expression. We're talking about gender, gender shifts and gender changes and hormone therapies. When we're talking about uh, human sexuality from the standpoint of gay people, lesbian and, 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 and gay men, what we're talking about is a sexual orientation. A gender expression is different from a sexual orientation, but they, are ten they tend to be lumped together in the same alphabets. So I think that we should read good books. There's several of them out there and educate ourselves in those conversations and then invite young people on purpose. Just having something to have a round table talk with LGBT young adults and young people and older folks in the same room will save volumes about your church. It will say that you're willing to take the risks, that you'll sit down and have the conversation. And I promise you, you'll learn something. Because gay people and trans people are not monolithic either. There's all kinds of, it's like it's all kinds of different kinds of straight identified people. Trust me on this. There's all kinds of different kinds of flowers in the garden of God, believe me. All right? And we need to be able not to pigeonhole people, stereotype people, and comfortably fit them into a certain place because you have an uncle that is gay or you have a daughter that is lesbian. There are a lot of different kinds of everything, many different things. If we can just kind of move away from oversimplifying the human expression, it will make room and space for us to see really how big God is because God is the one that made all of this. How big and how broad is God's creative ability, God's creative work, that we can be so many different things. And God does not require sameness. Isn't that lovely? We don't have to be the same to please God. So there's that. I hope that's helpful. Thank I hope you. that's helpful. Okay. So Tracy's question, how do I maneuver around church folks telling leadership to not be political? and yet work towards real change by working with current governments to make real change, to get beyond the Band-Aid solution that has been the reality for most churches? Well, if we're not going to speak truth to power, which is in many ways what the political process is, it's when people speak back to the government and speak truth to power, then we are not emulating the life of Jesus. Can I just put that out there? To those of us who identify as Christians, because you know it got him killed, but he did it. <laughs> he spoke truth to power. He went in the temple. Remember, let's talk about that Jesus, where people were selling pigeons and doves and lambs for more than what they were worth, and stealing from the people, the, and money changers, who who were running schemes and trying to get interest and putting people on, buy a sheep, pay a dollar down a day, <laughs> pay the rest later for uh, an interest rate. Jesus went through the temple. First of all, he took off his street clothes. Can I start with that? And tied up his undergarments <laughs> and went in the temple and flipped the tables over. How about that? And then he used what I call Jesus cussing. He, he said things like, you generation of vipers, you are white and sepulchers full of dead men's bones, you thieves and robbers, and I suspect some other choice words that he probably used. He spoke to them. He spoke to the priests. He spoke to the rich who did not give to the poor. He spoke truth to power. I don't have a Jesus in the manger or a Jesus on the cross. I also have a Jesus in the middle. Jesus in the middle was a justice warrior also. And someone who attended to the needs of people when society and religion simply would not. That is the Jesus that I know. That is the Jesus that informs my theology. 
So when people speak back to their preachers, their leaders, their pastors, and tell you not to be political, that is the same as saying, do not aspire to be like Jesus. I don't know where we get the little nam namby-pamby Jesus. I don't know where we get the, the afraid to speak truth to power Jesus from. I don't know where we get the soft and cushy cupcake with icing on the top Jesus. I don't know where we get that from. Understand what it cost him. The chief priests were furious with him because people were gathering to him. And when he, he did his last entry, the triumphal entry, as we call it, into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. He had been away from Jerusalem for a long time. He'd done most of his work in the suburbs out there with the people. And, and his headquarters was like Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house, out that way. When he came back into Jerusalem and they brought him through there after Lazarus was raised from the dead and the, the noise got out about that, the chief priest said among themselves, the whole world is going after him. That was when the plan came about to take him down. And he knew it. He told his disciples when they said, the whole world loves you. He said, except a tree fall from the ground and die, it shall not bring forth fruit. And if I be lifted up, and this was the word, the prophetic word of the cross, if I be lifted up, I will draw humankind unto me. He knew he was going to die when he was on the donkey. But he got on the donkey anyway. And he rode through town. And not many days hence, the word went out with a conspiratorial plan between the chief priests and the Romans. Let's crucify him. He died a Roman death at the behest of religion. Can I say that again? The state killed him at the behest of religion. And that is Jesus. That is the Jesus of history and the Jesus that we follow. What I'm saying to you is that if you are, don't have your hand in politics, if you are not helping people to eat, helping people to have decent jobs, helping people to have clean water, helping people to have shelter, helping people through a killer virus, helping people to learn the language of speaking for themselves and having strength and power and giving a, a respect to the people whose land you are on. If you are not doing that, in my mind, it is not the work of justice that we are doing. What we have created, is essentially private, Christian-based, Christian historical-based social clubs where we can go and be together, feel good about going, but not doing anything to change the world. If that sounds like harsh speech, it's not nearly as harsh as Jesus spoke <laughs> about what he saw during his time. The work of the church, triumphant, the work of the church right now is to speak truth to power. What does God require? Come on, brothers and sisters, kin folks, kindred. What is it that God requires? What does the Lord require but that we do justly and that we love mercy and that we walk humbly? And then all of the law and the prophets are in this. Love God with all of your heart, your mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as you love yourself. Think about that. Would you permit these wrongs to be done to you? And if they were done to you, wouldn't you want someone to help you? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That is the gospel. Amen? And praise God. You're, I, I see you talking, Tracy. Oh, <laughs> we, as somebody, Helen just asked me a question, no problem. Um, but we are getting close to the end of our time, but I think we have time for one more question, and it's a follow-up from John Pentland. And he says, I think God's heart is first to break 
the first tears to fall, and that we are in corporate grief. This liminal space is a strange gift. Richard Rohr calls this liminal space God's waiting room. Our response is like grief, a process, an opportunity to see what's being revealed, and it is hard work, this grief we are in. We'd yes. like a bit of discussion about that. Absolutely. And, and I would say, in fact, I said it to my family the other day, that we have moved from grief to grief, to grief, to grief. We certainly have, we're certainly having body politic grief and sadness about the, the way our, the children are being treated at the border. We are, we are sad about the loss of elders. We're grieving the fact that people who are grieving cannot have funerals to properly grieve the loss of their loved ones. We are grieving. We're grieving because we are, the things that ought to be obvious, like we ought all to be throwing everything we have into helping to find an end to this virus. And it ought not be politicized. We're grieving because the leadership of my nation and the current occupant of the White House just lies out loud. You don't have to wonder about it. I mean, it's, I don't, I'm not calling him a liar because I don't like him. He just lies right out loud. And even the people that support him know, know that. So yes, we've not quite seen a time like this. This is a complicated time. And yes, we are grieving. And yes, we are grieving. But I've learned some things, as I'm sure you have. Sometimes in your grief, you still have to do the work. And so, and so I'll leave you with this. In my early years of doing the work with HIV, during the dying years, when people were dying in the black community, in the gay community, in the music and arts community, sometimes two or three at a week, in a week, and I knew who they were. I have 141 funeral programs in my file of funerals that I did. And I just kind of need you to hear me say that. And I remember the early, early part of that reality and how it seemed that our governor, Ronald, Wait, Ronald Reagan, and, and then President Ronald Reagan would not even speak the word when, when we began to call it HIV. He wouldn't speak the word because they thought it was a gay disease and it was just going to kill all the gays. And it was some of that four horses of the apocalypse stuff out of Revelation and that it was going to just you know, destroy this community. So they didn't care. But I was, death was multiple death syndrome for me. And I remember the day that I sat down, I was listening to uh, Donny Hathaway's song, Giving Up is Hard to Do, which is, that's some wrist cutting blues music when I tell you. <laughs> Giving up is hard to do when you really love someone. And I had a, a, maybe a fourth of a glass of bourbon and Donny Hathaway, and I was sitting in the dark and having the greatest, prof most profound pity party. I'm telling you, it was just, my, my brokenness had come all the way to the top. But it was in my brokenness that the Spirit of God spoke to me. Now, that gives me the want to have a Pentecostal moment right here, but I'm gonna try to hold on to myself. I, I, in my brokenness and my sorrow, in that dark place where I was, the Spirit of God spoke to me and began to say to me what we were going to need to create in order to be a blessing in the AIDS epidemic. And I can tell you that getting to the point at which we have a medication that people can take to make the virus not communicable from one person to another was a long walk. And the greatest resistance that we had came from religion and church. But we did it anyway. And we kept working and we kept pushing and we kept fighting and we kept the sciences and the scientists know that we were on their side. We kept finding funding. We kept doing education. We kept working and we kept working and we kept working. And we kept working not just in the US, in Canada, and on the continent of Africa several places in Asia. We just kept working and we kept working because God gave us something to do with our grief. May I say to you, my beloved, 
that your grief can be turned into power. It can be turned into power. Grieve because we have lost a lot. But our grief can be translated into passionate power to help us overcome the time that we are dealing with, to shift, to change, to be something better and something greater for having been through what we have been through. I praise God today, even for my own exile. Had I, been, had I not been a person who knows what it feels like to be exiled, I would never have been called to so many people who have been exiled. Thanks be to God. It was a great gift. I didn't see it then, but I see it now. God can turn our grief into power, empathy, and planning and execution of those plans. Amen. God bless. Amen. Thank you. And it has truly been a blessing to have this time with you today. And we thank you once again for being with us. We look forward to the, uh, to the next opportunity, which will be tomorrow at the same time. And, uh, and we, God has blessed us with your presence and we just acknowledge that blessing. So thank you. My joy, sister. You know, I appreciate you, Sister Trina. I appreciate thank you. you so much. Blessings, everyone. Have a good rest of the day and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Well, folks, before we move on to the next thing, um, we think that it would be great to just take a few moments of an all-purpose break. So we're going to go uh, on pause, I think, for about five minutes uh, to give you a chance to sink into the words that you've heard and to prepare ourselves for the next stage of, of conversation and time together. And in that preparation, I would like to encourage you, if you are on Facebook, um, and you would like to join in the next piece, we're going to do a, um, a breakout in small groups and have um, a poll. So if you would like to go and sign back into Hoover or into Zoom, then you can be part of that conversation a little bit more actively than you will if you're just watching us on live stream.
There we go. Very good, Alan. Nice counting. That is lovely. So what we are going to do now is we are going to do an exercise in just talking about regional priorities. Um, so if you didn't happen to understand my instructions, you're fine if you're Zoom. It's just if you're live on Facebook, that would be where you'd need to go into Zoom. Um, when we invite folk into, um, into a group, if you happen to be in a, in a room with a whole bunch of people, you can just do that group too, or just accept the invitation as it comes to you. I have asked um, Eric Page, who is one of our exec executive members, to walk us through this particular section. So Eric, I don't know if you're ready, but you're up. I think I'm ready. Hopefully I'm ready. Yay. So uh, folks, as, as we are already aware, um, even though we have a significant amount of funds in our bank accounts, our, our income from mission and service will be reduced in 2022, which may mean a significant reduction to grant funds. Part of the work of the regional council, which is all the folk who have gathered here today, and of the regional executive of 2021, thank you, Trina, um, part of the work of the regional council, which is all of us and the regional executive, is to identify what our priorities and focus should be for the funds that we do have, so that our executive minister, Trina, can create a budget for us that reflects what we think are the most important items. Last year we, at the gathering, we had asked you to name what supports would be important to keep you connected in this new region. We asked you what areas needed our, needed our attention and the attention of the um, entire region and the regional staff. So I'm gonna pop up on the screen if I can, quickly a visual so you can see what I'm uh, discussing. At least I think I can do so. And if you can't, then um, Alan will put it up for you. Okay, well then, we'll just go with the easiest solution, Alan. Uh, Please uh, put up that visual up with the regional priorities, please. Excellent. So we had the idea of establishing best practices for our faith communities that reflect the diverse talents in our region, um, such as living in right and good relations, exploring the process of becoming an affirming region, being an intercultural region, including the differently abled, and addressing mental health issues. And before we head into our, our small groups today, we want you to choose a top five or a top three, preferably, of what you would like us to focus on. That way, the region and the regional staff can really focus on a few of those priorities and do them excellently. All right, so things like living reconciliation, um, intercultural awareness, affirming attitude, supporting mental health issues, pastoral care, youth and young adult ministry, clusters, networks, community of faith strengthening, learning opportunities, communication and leadership support. And part of the tough work is deciding where those priorities are, but it's not a new work for the church as Jesus set out priorities every day of his ministry, every week into his ministry. So we'd like to ask you and your small groups to have a discussion around some of these these topics and try and come out with a, a top three, top five that will come out in the poll that we can really help guide the work of the regional staff and further our ministry as God's church. So Eric, I'm just wondering if before we go into small groups, can we just have people take a quick poll on this? Um, just a quick, what's your first gut reaction of your top three? and then go into the small groups and talk it out with each other. Yes, that's an excellent idea, Helen. Just while uh, that's getting set up, I would also add that some of the conversation that we've had at Executive around priorities is focused around um, kind of three key areas. One is effective leadership. One is healthy communities of faith. And the third is uh, faithful public witness. 
So those are some of the areas that we've identified as priorities having heard from you at the last regional meeting. And so this is follow up to that work that was done last year just to ensure that we're moving along in the same direction. Okay, so we also have, we've got a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, can we just put that list up again, just so that people can look at it? Actually, we have three questions because one's mine. Um, how do, are we going to vote? Because this looks a little bit different than we're used to if we're voting in Zoom. Um, and uh, children's ministry, and my apologize, um, I apologize if I'm not using quite the language. Honestly, if you're looking at youth ministry, to me, children's ministry is included in that. Don't get mad at me. I know <laughs> that when you're dealing with a certain population that you have that specific language, but please, can we, for this purpose, include the children's ministry in with the youth and young adult ministry? Not forgotten, just named differently. I'm, I just add to that, that, that uh, the way we've been talking about this at the Communities of Faith Council and in the staff team is the first third of, of life ministry. So um, as, as PMR has been doing, we've been referring to it as first third. So how do we do the polling thing? So folks, you will have gotten a, a notification of a poll. You can pick your three and submit your poll. Um, if you didn't get a notification, uh, you don't see the message on the side in the Whova, you can go to your email. Um, you should have a link there that you can click in order to um, submit your um, suggestions or your thoughts as well. So pick three from the poll. It has been sent. We do have the results coming in so far. We got 104 people already participating. Um, and we got 120 on the, the Zoom, so I think we're getting up there pretty high on total participation. Thank you. All right. I see some more still popping in. I love that we're at like 210, I'm guessing, because that's how many ticks we're doing. So it's counting the total ticks, not the total people participated. Just in case people were wondering why we we're at 214 when we only got 120 people in here right now. That's that's my guess. Okay. So your list came to you in the poll, so I'm hoping that's enough. This is just a guideline, people. There is no way that we can encompass absolutely everything. And so Oftentimes when things are going to come in, we're going to take a look at what are the high priorities and does it fit into that high priority somehow. How are we doing? So um, there was a question from Charlie that said some idea of what the 2020 versus 2021 numbers are, and I'm assuming that that is um, that that is about finances. 
And at this point, we know that we're probably going to get about $40,000 less from the M&S grants. So I would just clarify, last year we received 289, and in 2020, we're anticipating that we'll be receiving 240. Okay, with a reminder that we are doing all kinds of work currently, and you would have seen that in your reports and your agenda. Eric, do you want to take us into um, small groups and just um, so that folk can um, talk about the options, what they didn't like, what they do like, and then we're going to get you to vote again. Let's see what we can come to. Uh, yes, folks, so in just a couple moments, we're going to be heading into those small breakout groups. Um, please, I encourage you to have an open dialogue with some of the things you feel passionately about, but also giving time to listen to the other folks in the groups that you may be uh, separated into. That way, um, we can have a healthy and inclusive dialogue about where these focuses should be. Um, I look forward to reconnecting with everyone after this breakout session. And then we'll have another poll again, just to see if anything's changed and where, um, where those passions may lie. So and just to confirm, I'm doing 10 minutes and I'm doing breakouts of four to six. That's acceptable, Eric? Oh, yes, please, Helen. That Oops. sounds good. And just uh, also wanted to just reiterate that the work that we're doing here is, is to help the executive do its work. So we're not making decisions about what priorities. This is an opportunity for the executive, according to our governance structure, to listen to the constituency and to hear what it is that, that you feel is working, where you feel some of the gaps are, and that you can kind of share that uh, back with us. So if there are some really important learnings from there, not just in the voting, but also in some of the, the conversation that you experience, we're going to want to hear that as well. So you might want to have somebody take some notes. So just give it a minute as Chris got working on it. you know all of those things <laughs> yeah, absolutely so um aldine uh knows uh, a little bit about what i do on a day-to-day -day basis unfortunately she can't uh, it doesn't seem like i can hear her audio um but uh for the
I am assuming everybody who is here does not want to be in a breakout room, which is totally legit. You're most welcome to stay here. Uh, there's just not much going on, but it's all good. If you want to be in a breakout, uh, raise your hand or indicate in some way, and I will uh, make sure you're assigned. But it looks like everybody is assigned. So. Can you put the list up somewhere for us, Alan, just so people can see that list again if they want to go look at it? Yes. Thank you. Alan, is, is that all of the options or are some of them cut off? Okay, thanks. That's it, we got 10 options. Um, yep, that's good, thank you. Hey, Helen, do you have a title for your sermon yet on Thursday? <laughs> I'm what doing sermon? up the PowerPoint. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't. You, do you care to have one? Not particularly. Okay, it's just going to say message. Okay. Should I say sure. a brilliance? Sure, or reflection. Or, or do or... you want me to do radical, um, radical inclusion? Sure. Okay. It's not written yet. I have no idea. Huh. I have to do a, a homily for the funeral on Saturday and my sermon for Sunday. Are you preaching as well on Sunday? Yes, ma'am. Holy. And I have a funeral service on Sunday afternoon. And she's moving Tuesday. Oh, jeez. Like, oh my gosh. If any of you folks that are not in breakout rooms wanted to be in breakout rooms, just type in the chat and Alan can help you with that. I have to leave a little bit early, so I'm not put myself in there. No, that's fine. I just want to make sure that people weren't out because they got missed. Vicky, you're still on. Chewing my gum? Okay. Yep. <laughs> Good thing I wasn't talking about you, Helen Reed. Because you know I listen to every word you say, right? <laughs>
so you're aware there are just two minutes left for folks talking and I was just looking through the list and I'm feeling bad breakout room two is not joined by very many people I'm, uh, they, there's only two of them in there they got six people assigned to them just only two went and I feel bad I'm just expressing my sadness for those people no need to uh, well hopefully they had a good conversation with each other uh, you get a lot more talking time when you're just two so um, really they should be grateful I guess Alan, if we want to let people bring feedback back into verbal feedback, is the best way just for you to let them unmute themselves or raise their hand or? That, that's up to how you folks want to do it. Um, I can let people unmute themselves and then they can do it, but you're going to get a bit if they raise their hand. Um, we are all, all, are all in um, Zoom here. You can raise your hand and on the mobile. Um, it's not super difficult to raise your hand, um, so we could do that. Get them to raise their hand or just type in the comment that they'd like to speak, I guess, would be the easiest thing, and then we can call on them. Yep, that is doable. Okay. Yep, okay. It looks like we might be starting to come back. Well, oh, here we go. Probably just as well I didn't know Nora was on there. I'd have been more nervous. So everyone should be back now, Helen. Okay, so what we have um, done is, Eric, you're up again. So here are your instructions, sir. <laughs> um, we're gonna ask people to put their comments and questions in the chat. And if you would like to speak, please just let put that in there. And then Alan will um, unmute you so that you can speak. And Eric, if you would keep track and just make sure that we hear what we need to hear, please. Yes, I will keep track. Perfect. So if you would like to speak, put your name in the chat. And if you have something you just want to type in there, we'll take that too. Sorry, Gary, that you had challenges with the breakout room, but uh, if you have thoughts about priorities, we're happy to hear them. So folks are saying there wasn't enough time. Would you like more time in small groups? With people who have their uh, videos on, can you nod or shake your head about extra time? Got a little bit of a split. 
and just reading in the um, in the chat there, uh, somebody Sam uh, made a good point. Sam Grunberg, I have no idea what your um, groups were. Um, I randomly assigned them the first time, and I could not put you back in the same group if my life depended on it. Um, so you would not actually be able to continue your discussion, um, which would make the more time potentially more difficult. Um, so good catch, and sorry about that. You can still go back and chat more, um, but you won't be with the same people unless luck has it that way. So lots of interest in having some uh, in prioritizing first, third ministries. So hearing that around um, children, um, youth and young adults, campus ministries, which I agree is rightfully all sort of classed in that first, third ministry uh, time. So that's great. Some feedback around reconciliation, affirming first, third, strengthening of communities of faith, learning opportunities, mental health, communication from group three. So there's been some concerns uh, raised about communication network and clusters. Uh, seems to be informed by the fact that several members were in rural communities and concerned about feeling connected. Uh, another group talked about communication, keeping us connected in COVID times um, and clusters as a way of connecting congregations and providing support, supporting innovation and congregations, intercultural work so if any of you, I, if uh, Tim or David, if you want to speak to that, you could just maybe raise your hand in Zoom and we could open your mic. Eric, feel free to jump in here. I'm just managing dead air. Oh, you're doing a wonderful job at managing the dead air. <laughs> it seems like one of the common themes is the, the um, improving uh, leadership and supporting communities of faith, so perhaps things around lay leadership and other things as well. Um, that seems to be one of the most common ones that I'm seeing so, f so far. Yeah, it looks like community of faith, uh, leadership development and first third are strong priorities. I saw reconciliation and indigenous ministries in, in several comments as well. Uh, Okotoks United Church is asking, why would we change priorities from last year when we haven't spent a lot of time on them to this point? Yeah, I don't think it's so much changing. I think we're just checking that, you know, after a year into it, do these still feel like the right priorities? You know, we just don't want to do the work in a vacuum. You know, we want to make sure that we're checking and receiving feedback to ensure that you feel like your voices are heard and that you're in a position to check in with the executive and inform them about, you know, how the work we're doing is landing in the, in the constituency. Dave Pollard has his hand up. I think you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Alan unmuted me. Um, I, I was a co-host, but I'm not now because I had to leave to do the poll and come back for some reason. I got my privileges taken away, but that's okay. I um, just wanted to add that <clears throat> just because we're identifying top three priorities doesn't mean that the other priorities fall off the radar completely. Um, I think the executive, um, and maybe this goes to Okudo's question, I think the executive has had a, a number of priorities that it's been been juggling. Um, we just want to be able to get a, a feel from the constituency, as Trina said, to help direct her work, to help the executive set how we're going to um, enable her 
uh, in her work on our behalf and in particular the staff as well, what we want them to focus on. And we can't do that. We can't be all things to all people. Um, and so we just need to know that, that, that there will be some areas of the work of the church that in this moment will have focus because that's what the constituency wants. <clears throat> the other things will still be there, but will there be an intense focus on them? It's not like they're going to drop off the radar screen if they don't make the first kind of third of the, of the first three priorities. That's great. Um, Alan, can you unmute uh, Tim Nethercott? He would like to speak. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, our group had uh, two, three, uh, two members from uh, outside of Calgary. And uh, I was uh, interested to hear uh, that uh, being concerned about feeling connected was very important, uh, very important to them. Uh, mind you, if you said, if you stacked up affirming, living into right relations and intercultural awareness and said, which of those do you choose? Uh, just like uh, David and uh, Susan said from, uh, uh, from High River, uh, I think it would be hard to choose between them. Can't we do, uh, can't we do all of them? But uh, with uh, Calgary-centric uh, awareness, it was it was good to hear that uh, there's something else we need to have on the agenda. Thank you. I'm noticing a, a thread of comments around mental health and I and and just a recognition that um, in the time of COVID, the mental health question has been brought to the forefront in, in a big way. Um, and so that has been informing um, a lot of the, the operational decisions that uh, I've been making as executive minister and that, our, and that my team have been making, just recognizing the circumstances um, are, are challenged. Alan, could you unmute Kathy Yamashita, please? Hello, um, so our little group was mostly Southern Alberta people. Uh, we're we're um, Southern Alberta and then a gentleman from Troshu. Um, <clears throat> uh, we believe that uh, there's certain ministries that will not survive unless some assistance is given financially. And that would be something like uh, church camps. Canyon Church Camp, for example, needs money to rebuild. Um, following the devastating 2017 fire. So without some financial support, that ministry may never um, start up again. Ecumenical Campus Ministry in Lethbridge is $25,000 in deficit, and that might cause the demise of this 25-year ministry, which has won awards for its excellence. So we, we voted for Youth and Young Adult Ministry intercultural uh, awareness and uh, Indigenous support. Thank you. So part, part of this too is just to um, also have an idea of having conversations and seeing when we, our first gut reaction and then perhaps after we've had a conversation with other people, would you change your answer? So someone said, can we have a second poll? That is the plan. So now that you've had a little bit of a discussion in a breakout group, we're going to ask you to do the same poll again. Would you change your priorities after you have discussed with the people that you weren't expecting to have a conversation with? Alan, can you poll us, please? Sorry, I was busy sending out the other poll. It should be it's said now. It's open. <laughs> just just click the send thing. I just got a notification on my phone for the poll. Everybody who is attending the meeting got the notification. So even if you're not a voting person, uh, that was the instruction that you all get to participate in, in this um, process. So.
Wilma, thank you for your comment about the communication. We have been working hard to be quite proactive in communication, even more intentionally so during COVID. So thanks for that acknowledgement. We really appreciate it. So Alan, can, can you tell people how to find the poll? I think most of us are in Zoom. Yep, so uh, the poll was sent out the same as before. So you've had Zoom pop up, but you should still have your um, web browser open uh, into Whova. So you can go in there and there should be a new message for you. Uh, you can refresh um, or reload your screen if it's not, or just click into the message sometimes and that works. Uh, your mobile device may have gotten a notification. Um, if not, uh, you can go into your messages. So you may need to leave the session um, and go to your messages and find the new poll and then just come back and join the session afterwards. And it does take a minute or two and because I knew exactly uh, what was going on earlier, I could send it in advance. And this time um, I was prepping it and getting ready uh, to send it for this time. And I didn't want you responding too, too soon because Helen might not have wanted that. So I didn't send it um, as much in advance this time. So your poll will be found within Whova. If you're not registered uh, for the event, um, then you're not going to uh, receive the poll. Um, you may have gotten otherwise, but if you are registered, you should get it. Um, and you should also get it in your email um, as an option as well. So you can click that link in your email. Um, again, that can take time based on your email, um, which I have no control over. Oh my gracious, if only I had control over how fast emails could go, wouldn't life be lovely? Um, but you will have received the poll in a few different ways so you can respond. That's great. So we're starting to see some poll results come in. But if folks wish to continue to make comments in the chat, or if you wish to speak, if you raise your hand in Zoom so that we know we want to speak, then we can open your mic, or you can also comment that you'd like to speak in the chat. Right, Wilma, it is hard to vote because everything is important. Looking like there's three fairly clear priorities, community of faith strengthening, youth and young adult ministry, which we're talking about as first third ministry and living reconciliation. Where would things like church planting and strategic planning for the future fall in these categories? I wonder if that might be under community of faith strengthening, Sam. I would say community of faith strengthening and uh, learning opportunities and leadership support, which also I think um, is one of the main ways to support mental health issues as well through learning opportunities and leadership support, but that's just how I interpret that. I think as Eric has um, shared this with us, um, and as we've done this, I wonder if this might be an opportunity to see how complicated life really is at the um, levels of the church that have to make decisions. Um, there has been a shift in some of the answers in the polls after you've talked to somebody else. And oftentimes what I find is that's because you have a conversation with someone who is really passionate about a particular area. And so they can give you more information that you didn't have before. That definitely happens when we're looking at executive decisions and things shift. And it's helpful for us to know what your biggest priorities are, 
But let's be really honest that our priorities in January shifted immensely in March. Everything got thrown out of the window and we had to look at everything from a different lens. And so part of this exercise is also to help you understand that we are juggling so many balls and we are doing our best, but occasionally, occasionally, we have to make decisions based on what the best option is for that moment. Does that make sense to folk? These are very, very broad categories. We know that. Um, and we know that you would fit things in. So I guess in some ways, if you are asking the executive and our executive mini, uh, minister for funding, if you see that we have three or four really high um, regional priorities, how does your request fit into that priority? That is really helpful for us to hear. Absolutely, Trevor, we need to be working and not reinventing everything. We are certainly, um, we actually partner with um, Pacific Mountain Region a lot. You would be surprised um, that uh, we do a lot of, uh, of conversations in between and sharing programs and getting ideas from each other. We share quite a bit. And so um, that is already happening. Does anybody else have any other pieces of um, wisdom they would like to share with us through the chat? I uh, just want to acknowledge some of the comments that you're making about the work of the executive and staff. We, uh, we appreciate those kind words and, uh, and, uh, your trust and faith in our leadership. It's, it's, it's really, um, it's really lovely. Okay. So thanks Eric for jumping in with absolutely no notice. Good job. Um, thank you to everybody else for joining in and having those discussions and please give feedback. We want to hear from you. Um, recognizing as life always is, sometimes the answers you get are not the ones you want. But the fact that you ask the questions raises things in our minds and offers us direction for when we have flexibility to move in different ways. So thank you so much for all of that work. I'm hoping that we will be able to take a look at the two polls later on and see and see that shift because I'm sure that I saw a shift in there somewhere. So that would be lovely. So thank you for that. So. Can I say something? Um, just on the comment about partnership, one of the things, and, and just recognizing the, uh, you know, the highlighted of the of priority for support to leadership. Um, I wanted to comment that, that I have been sharing the programming that is happening in Pacific Mountain region that's being put on by leadership uh, with Chinook Winds. It is PMR programming and, and perhaps one of the partnership conversations we need to have is, is, is about moving leadership over to also include Chinook Winds. So it doesn't feel like you're just being invited to be guests in someone else's home, but that it's something that you share. But in the meantime, do know that the um, invitations that you're receiving are, are genuine invitations and that we really do want you to take advantage of some of those programs that are being run. In particular, the, the next week, the Kootenai Faith Fest, which is a, a program designed for small communities of faith that targets both lay and ordered leadership. And it's like super cheap. It's like $30 or something to attend. And it's going to be really fabulous with a really, really good uh, theme speaker. Um, and uh, there's also uh, one that's being run with um, Janice McLean, um, which is about nurturing the soul of the pastor. And, you know, both of those are, are really, really excellent programs that are genuinely open to you. So please do feel 
um, like those invitations are real invitations and take advantage of the opportunities that are uh, available to you there and we'll be having some conversations after, you know about the the priorities that you've named but certainly that support to leadership and support to communities of faith are are clearly high priorities and one of the best ways to support communities of faith are to support raise up and uh, and spiritually um, fill up your leaders. And so we really want to encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities. Thanks. Thank you, Gina. All right. So I think that we have just about come to the end of our day. There are a couple of things that I would like to remind you about. One is we begin tomorrow with worship at 1.30. So we'll open up all the fancy little doors and windows so you can get in um, about 15 minutes beforehand. Um, we do begin with theme with our last session with Yvette Flunder. So please be ready because man, she's good, isn't she? Just so enjoying this time with her. Then we have about half an hour that's called Outstanding Conversations. And in that particular time, what we wanted to do was just take a look and see if there were questions or things that we have gone over fairly quickly that you would like to have a little bit more information on or a little bit more discussion. If you have something that you would like us to fit into there, then please um, probably email Chinook Winds region and we'll pick that up and, uh, and we'll see if we can fit that into that time. We wanted to keep it flexible because we had no idea what kind of reactions you were going to have to this stuff and we wanted to honor your voices. Then we'll go into business, um, voting on the remit, um, letting you know about our fantastic staff and reminding you about who we are. Um, and then um, in the evening, at 7 p.m., please, please come back and join us in the evening so that you can be the witnesses and that cloud of people who will support Jon Snow as we celebrate his ordination. Okay, let's have a look and see. I think we are done. So let us just have our benediction and go for supper. Go forth this afternoon, for the love of God is yours to share. The peace of Christ is yours to extend. The power of the Holy Spirit is yours to offer. Amen. Be well, friends. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>